Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. I just want to real quick tell the audience that we've been having technical issues. We are like 25 minutes late because <laughs> everything crashed. <laughs> Technology crap. We did it again. We did it again. I think the technology couldn't handle the two of us together. Yeah, and what I was saying before was the the revenge, the revenge of an empath, where as an empath or a sensitive, everything affects us, and then at a certain point, we start affecting everything else. So it's <laughs> it's a high time for the empathic revenge. That's right. The empathic. Oh, that's a good title for a book. Right. The, <laughs> the empathic, empathic revenge. <laughs> I love it, the empathic revenge. So, um, tell you what, um, I would love for you to tell my audience at least a little bit about you yeah. and your background. I know most of them know you, but just in case there's a sure. couple of them out there that don't, uh, I'd love for them to know more about you. Because yeah, I know absolutely. you, you've come, you've just joined the the Hay House stable, and you've just yeah. launched your second book and stuff like that. Well, you know, it's a very exciting time. And, and, you know, my spiritual journey began when I was eight years old. And when I was eight years old, I had an out-of-body experience. And I went to a celestial realm that I, to this day, know to be heaven. Uh, very, very similar to your experience in a different way. And I went to heaven. And when I fell back in my body, uh, I started to have profound awarenesses. And along with this experience that I spent my life reconciling, I had this ability, uh, which I didn't know was an ability at the time, where I could feel other people's emotions. And what I thought was that uh, everyone was mad at me. So I spent most of my childhood trying to cheer people up, thinking when they can feel good around me, that means they like me. I didn't realize I was an empathic healer. And I spent most of my life having a lot of very vivid spiritual experiences and realizations, not, to, not only to realize my ability as an empathic healer, but to go through the various stages of awakening that helped me to realize myself uh, in my truest sense. And so in my current work, uh, my work is to bridge the gap between the mystical and the awakening journeys and to help beings who are sensitive and empathic to make sense of their sensitivities and to take what seems like a curse or an illness and to develop into highly masterfully uh, honed intuitive skills and to allow us to really live as a fully embodied soul on this planet. I love it. I love it. <laughs> and it's so funny because a lot of the things you felt as a child is so mm. similar to the things I felt. And so it's, it's interesting because my sensitivity um, led me to become, to actually become a people pleaser because mm. it was so important to me that everybody around me was happy because if they weren't happy, I wasn't happy. I would feel it. And so I, it was like I made it my mission to make everybody okay. They needed mm. to be okay for me to be okay. And that so made me a people pleaser and a doormat. And I think yeah. empaths, um, not all, but many of them have a tendency to this, to do this simply for that reason, that because they need everyone around them to feel good so that they can feel good because they're feeling everybody's emotions. And so we end up going out of our way to make sure everybody's happy and everybody's okay and everyone's feeling good. And when they're all feeling good, then ha, ah, I can feel good. But by then you're worn out, you're drained and you right. end up starting or at least this is the case with me not everybody but i started to lose myself in other people i didn't mm. know who i was because i was always trying to be what everyone else wanted me to be and for me this caused me to lose myself and become completely drained to the point where it started to reflect on my health and mm. and i got cancer and even when i had cancer i was still more concerned about the feelings of other people than my own Mm. It literally took death for me to realize, not cancer, but death mm. for me to realize that, hey, you matter, you have a purpose, that you're here for a reason and you don't need cancer or anything else as an excuse to love yourself and be yourself and express all of who you are because we are all facets of God. And in fact, what I realize is that when we know that we're facets of God, what right do we have not to love and express ourselves? Because then you're 
preventing God from expressing him or herself through you. So we don't have a right to prevent that. So that's what I realized from my experience on the other side, which is what saved my life. Well, that's, you know, I mean, as you, whenever you speak about it, it always touches my heart when I listen to you. And if we want to, you know, distill a modern day spiritual journey in the old days, we would say we wake up out of Maya or illusion. And in the modern day, basically, we don't have to call it Maya or illusion. We call it codependency. And when we talk about waking up out of ego, we're really waking up out of the dream that says I have the right to limit my light, to shut down my heart and to think of myself as less than the divine perfection that I am. And so, you know, what makes us very similar on our journey as we help a lot of people is that you and I both teach a very heart-centered path. We teach a lot about self-love and both of us have been blessed to be touched by, um, you know, otherworldly experiences that have brought us back to the fact that it is the loving of ourselves that truly awakens and helps us embody our divinity for the well-being of our planet. Beautifully said, and, uh, and I know that the reason why I resonate with you and your work is because you are totally heart-centered, yeah. because um, one of my problems is that I find it hard not to be heart-centered, so <laughs> I, think, I think one of the problems I had and one of the problems that actually um, caused me to be sick in the first place was because I used to judge that as being a weakness. I used to judge mm. myself for being an empath, for... Um, you know, and, and I f used to feel that I needed to think things through more. I needed to come from my head more. I needed to be more grounded and all these other kinds of things. Right. Now, although I know it would be good if I thought things through sometimes or was more <laughs> grounded, but I don't judge myself for being the way I am. I see those things as gifts. And, and what I love about you is that I see those traits in you as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. well I appreciate that. It's, it's an honor to, re to really receive that. And, you know, in my life, it's been an interesting journey to find other people that are truly coming from the most heart-centered place um, in terms of the work that we do. And so uh, to, to, to meet you and to connect with you and is, is such a great honor to, to know you as you know, a peer and an equal. Uh, so, so with that in mind, um, what would you say in your current incarnation is the hardest part of being heart-centered? Wow. Okay. So the hardest part is, <clears throat> so um, the way I, I have, it's a great question and my answer is going to be a little bit long-winded if you can <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> That's all right. The hardest part, the short answer is the hardest part is living in a world where people believe that we need to be head-centered or brain-centered okay right. so that's the shortest uh, short answer mm -hmm. is is being someone who is naturally heart-centered and i'm not alone in this there are so many people tuned in who resonate with your work and my work and the reason right. i do this is because i know there are millions of people who are like you and me we are not right. alone but we live in a world that has been created by people who believe that we have to be head-centered and it's created for people who are head-centered and we are heart-centered people and we need to navigate this world that is the hardest part and what i say the way i would say it is we are six sensory beings mm. living in a world created by people who think we are five sensory beings. Mm -hmm. So the world has been created by people who think we are five sensory beings. And so they have created it for five sensory beings. Mm -hmm. But in actuality, we are six sensory beings. And, and when you realize you're a six sensory being, the hardest part is integrating that sixth sense into this world created for five sensory beings. There you go. Well said. <laughs> and I, I, I agree. You know, I think for me, also, just to add to this, um, the hardest part of being heart-centered for me is actually the same thing that drives me. And what drives me is my entire life, I've taken everything 100% personally. And when I discovered this journey, my abilities, the ability to serve many people in the audience, to provide healing energy through the sound of my voice and to create group healing energies and the things that I do, when I found that, I, I found an outlet to where if I took it personally, 
it would only drive me to be better and better. And so throughout my life, I've taken everything personally. Um, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I, I allow myself to feel whatever arises. And it doesn't mean I respond from an unconscious place because I'm a very loving person. I just, but I feel everything. And even as far as I've gone in my journey, you don't not feel things. It's just that what I have found is that to take things personally is to get so close to the moment. It's to be so one with the present moment where if you get close enough, you take it so personally that it actually stops affecting you. So for, from in my current reality, I take things so personally that it drives me to do better work and better work and to raise the stakes each and every time, kind of like a spiritual athlete. But I've gotten so close and intimate with present moment reality to where I allow myself to feel anything that's arising, but I get so close and intimate with reality that there's nothing to be felt at all. See, very well said. That was beautifully said. And I relate to it because this is the thing. What we have been trained, conditioned to do is mm. don't take it personally. So right. when we feel that pain, when we feel that sensitivity, we're like, oh, I'm going to, I'm not going to take it uh, personally. And so we avoid it. Right. And people who are sensitive are told, don't be so sensitive. Right. Why not? The world needs sensitive people. Right. And so what we do is we suppress our sensitivity and we say, oh, I shouldn't be so sensitive. I shouldn't take that personally. And we avoid it. We avoid feeling those painful emotions. Mm. But you're right. Those painful emotions are the fuel. They are the fuel for us to go deeper and take this further and drive our teachings and our learnings mm. and our writing. It, it's the pain that actually strengthens us, like exercising, like, like weightlifting. Yeah, I love Absolutely. it. Very well said. Oh, well, thank you. And, you know, just just to uh, just because when you when you said that, what, what, what dropped in is I don't know how I realized this, but you know, when you, you're a kid and you realize something profound, but you need your entire adult life to unpack it. Yeah. So I had an awareness when I was a kid, but I didn't know I'd have the maturity to really understand it. But I remember being a kid and having the awareness of I had a lot of people in my life telling me to not take things personally, but uh -huh. none of those none of those people were who I wanted to grow up and become. So they were instantly, instantly, it was like I was seeing through it like, hmm, if the people I don't want to become are telling me not to be sensitive, then maybe being sensitive is where I want to go. And then the whole conversation was, well, if you take things personally, it's going to be painful. And what I had in my life, and I've always had this natural form of inquiry, like I didn't have a formal spiritual teacher in human form, I always had the universe talking to me, but I've always had this natural curiosity, which creates this natural self-inquiry process. And so for me, what, I, what happened was, I wouldn't have a, any sense of getting away from the pain or wanting to change my experience. It's just not something I was hardwired with. Anytime I felt something, even when I was a kid or an adolescent or a teenager, there would be something inside of me that would want to look at it and just get curious as to what, what is this? What does it really mean to be in pain? And when, I, when, I, when, I, when I'm uncomfortable, what happens if I actually go into it like it's a like it's a black hole? Where will I wind up on the other side? So it was almost like my emotions were like a wormhole into other aspects of the universe that I would explore within myself. And I can't tell you why that is, but it's always been alive within me. And that's part of what really drives me to help people as a teacher, because I am always interested in the things that people want to get beyond. And so just like you, we can be very compassionate tour guides and companions to help people face the things that may not initially feel good, yeah. but are always there to help us evolve and transform. Yeah, again, very beautifully said. I have to admit that when I was younger, when I was a kid, yeah. when I felt sensitive, I wanted to run away from it. Yeah. I wasn't as curious to <laughs> unpack it and look at it because to me that was painful you know it was i was an extremely sensitive introverted shy kid yeah um you know and i was i was bullied as a kid as well yeah, but, me too. yeah you too huh yeah mm. but all of that made us who we are and Absolutely. i wouldn't trade it for anything like people tell me oh the cancer nearly killed you i actually believe the cancer saved my life I love that. Yeah, because I was killing myself even before I got the cancer. 
I think our bodies are so much smarter and more resilient than we give them credit to be. Our mm. bodies are reacting to us, to our, to our soul, to our heart, to our emotions. And, and our bodies are actually communicating with us all the time. It's a reflection of our heart and our emotion. But that doesn't mean if you're sick that it's your fault. I'm not saying it in a way that you have to blame yourself if you're sick or sure. your health is not good. Um, that's not the case at all. It's nobody's fault because we're all doing the best that we can. And if you're going through pain, a lot of it is because of stuff you've had to deal with that's through no fault of your own. Right. Um, you know, we have to deal with things like whether it's bullying or abuse and so on. And, and this causes a reaction within you, which may cause your body to react a certain way. Um, and, and if anyone's dealing with anything, I just wanted to say that you, uh, I, I tend to believe that you don't necessarily have to go back and unpack what's causing your illness. Right. You can actually look to the future and get excited about your future and the biggest um the biggest thing that heals you is an excitement for life so yeah that's i love that yeah i i truly believe that i don't really like to go and relive the past and regurgitate it absolutely well and i'm right there with you in fact um you know we were talking before we took this uh live stream or this uh, facebook live and you're working on a new book and I'm going to start writing my next, my third book in a couple months. And something that I downloaded at a recent event that's going to be in my next book, uh, which is it kind of parallels what you were saying. And it is a realization that I had a little bit ago. And then I realized my third book is where it's going to be included. And the, in the third, in, in this book, what I, what I realized as it, you know, and I've been working as a healer for about, you know, about 14 years now is that, what we are doing as healers for people that are healing is helping them to understand the process of healing, which is a transformative journey, as you very, you know, know very well indeed. And in a healing journey, the, the force that we are befriending is time. And that if you think of an emotion that needs to be healed, and again, this is contrary to most you know, the spiritual paths out there that say, when an emotion comes up, you apply a process and this is what makes it go away. And what I've realized in the work that I've done in working with the universe is that every single emotion that we're meant to face and heal is only healed by spending a predetermined time in that emotional state. And the longer you spend that emotional state, the more experience and the more insight drops in about your life and about that emotion and as soon as you've spent the time you're destined to spend in that emotional state, it dissolves and heals. So imagine someone who is meant to spend a certain amount of state in sadness and is applying all these processes to sadness. And as soon as that time is up for that they have been contractually obligated to spend in the sadness for their soul's evolution, they believe it's all the processes they've been applying to sadness that must have healed it. When in reality, what we're really helping people do is to make peace with time because when we're in harmony with time, we allow ourselves to learn about the insights and the consciousness that's expanding by spending time under the pressure of certain emotions. Ooh, see, that's powerful. Yeah. That's powerful. And you can apply it to a lot of things because even... When you're going through an illness, like even when I was going through the illness, and I speak to people who are going through illnesses, and it's very natural to want to try everything. We're like, right. you're trying every kind of healing modality, every spiritual modality, and you're trying everything, and nothing seems to work. But then one day something happens and mm. the healing begins. And people say, okay, so what was it? What was it that healed it? Maybe it was none of those things. Maybe you just had to spend that much time feeling those emotions that go with going through that illness. And to piggyback on what you said, you said what heals us is looking to the future. Yeah. Now, if you imagine someone who's going through a debilitating illness, when in their consciousness, they feel almost like a prisoner in their own body, how does a prisoner survive any prison sentence, but by looking to the future and looking to their parole date. Yeah, 
That's really how you survive <clears throat> by looking to the future. See, I, I tend to uh, believe that all of us, we have a calling mm. and our calling is actually our future calling us. I love that. Yeah, and that's what keeps us going. It keeps us going through, um, you know, tough times, tough emotions, illnesses. It keeps us going because it's that excitement about the future and having that hope about the future that that actually um, that in fact it increases the um, I don't remember the medical term for it, but the is it the serotonin or something in your so. body? Yeah, that that leads to healing and mm. it keeps you alive. It keeps you healthy, but it's when you lose hope that your health goes down, which is why I never understand why doctors can tell people you only have three months to live or you only have six months to live because that in itself mm -hmm. makes the person feel fear, depressed and all these things that are going to deplete the immune system. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, you know, and when someone is told they have three months to live, you know, it's either going to be the response of fight or flight or freeze. And so the hope, the hope for the evolution of consciousness in a human being is if a doctor says to you, you have three months to live, you either say, I'm going to prove them wrong, or I'm going to start living like there's no tomorrow. And in living a fully present life and living a life where literally the, the, the door of destiny is opening up and it's every step is, is leading us towards that last breath. If we can be motivated by that, we can actually start to tap into um, our intuitive healing processes within ourself. Um, so it's interesting that on an emotional level, what heals us is just time spent in certain emotions. And what can actually heal us of certain incurable illnesses is the threat of no more time. And so it's interesting how time on both levels can act as our healer. I like that. So let's talk more about time and time mm. acting as our healer, because that's a really great topic. Totally. So, yeah. So tell me more about how you believe time is the healer or time. Um, yeah, the time heals us. Well, I just, you know, in, in, in between my teachings and in my personal life, I'm always inquiring. I'm always looking. I'm always growing and evolving. And I'm always exploring and doing what I call social experiments. And I'm always just questioning things and looking at things. And what, what I've come to see is that there is simply a time spent in certain experiences, like you or someone is determined to spend a certain amount of time in a relationship. And then it is our perception, it is our inner narrative, it is our viewpoint that says it lasted this long because it was cut short because, and that becomes the overlay of our belief system when in reality, we were meant to meet on a certain time, we were meant to stay together for a certain time, and when it was time for us to be pulled apart, there was some sort of twist of fate or series of events that made it logical to our nervous systems to perceive, I once was with this person, now I'm not. So in the healing journey, what I, what I see a lot of times is that everyone is trying to do the best they can to spend the least amount of time in a healing crisis with a disease or an illness. The belief is if I give in to the illness or the disease, it's gonna overtake me and I'm gonna die. And what I find when I help people is when we are able to really be in harmony with a, with a disease, when we are really in harmony with basically what is struggle, discomfort, frustration, and pain, what we are basically making peace with is the ego's tendency to fight spending long durations of time in unpreferential circumstances. And when we spend that extended period of time in experiences we don't prefer, the heat of adversity and the pressure causes our consciousness to pop open and to expand if we can actually just sit in time and literally just transcend this momentary barrier of what we know as personal agony. Wow. It's very deep. It's very deep. It's very beautiful. It's yeah. very, very beautiful. Um, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of people find really hard to do. I know that 
there was a time when I wouldn't be able to do that, but I train myself to do it. And I actually consciously, for example, um, in, in smaller ways, like I actually tell myself things like, um, it, how does it feel? Like, how would it feel mm -hmm. to, to be a complete, um, to be a complete failure or to be really poor or to be sick or to have cancer again. And I kind of go into that feeling so that I, um, I, I, I go into that feeling so that I can get to the point where I'm not afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's so older. that I lose the fear of it. So in other words, if you want to be good at something, let's say, because I've started, ever since Wayne discovered my story, he threw me on the world stage. So there I was thrust on the stage and I was like, oh my God, I'm a public speaker by accident. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, yeah, and it was literally at the deep end. The first time that happened, he pulled me up on stage in front of 3,000 people. And, <laughs> and he says, um, tell everyone your story. And I was like holding the microphone going, uh... <laughs> And he goes, are you scared? And I said, of course I'm scared. I've never spoken in front of 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. And he said, but you've been dead and back. What have you got to be scared about? <laughs> and so I said to him, actually, being dead is easier than public speaking. Oh, yes, right. Being dead is a lot, hard, is a lot easier than living, that's for sure. But you know what's funny? Do you know what? This is the funniest thing. And this is actually how I learned to overcome the fear of pain in my own life. Do you know the very thing that allowed you to get on stage and speak in front of 3,000 people for the first time is you had no option. And I think that what, what's amazing is to see that if someone is in pain, because I've done this, I've been in excruciating pain and I've actually used it to inquire into. And in excruciating pain, I asked myself, what makes this painful? And what I found out was the pain, the sensation wasn't what caused the pain because I realized the sensation was just my body's way of telling me there's a tremendous amount of change happening under a short duration of time. So lots of change happening under a short duration of time created this sensation that wasn't pleasant for me. Ah. But, what, but what, what caused pain was a belief that I thought there was another option called not being in pain. And I thought it was an option I didn't know how to access. And when I allowed myself to feel pain with no option but being in pain, that's when the pain began to disappear. See, that's really good. Um, that's, that's a really good way of doing it. That didn't occur to me. Maybe I wasn't <laughs> that smart because what I started to do, so I, actually, I actually did two things. One was I started to this is after because then when the next thing that happened was Wayne and Hay House, they started mm. to schedule me to speak at all these I Can Do It events. And so I did two things. One was um, Cheryl Richardson. She gave mm. me advice. She said, speak like you're speaking to one person. And I thought, right. oh, that is a great idea. So I did. I spoke like I was speaking to one person. And, it, and what I would do is I would home in on one person in the audience mm. that looked like they needed to hear what I needed to say. Mm. And I would just focus and speak on, speak to one person and feel like I'm speaking to their heart, to that person's mm. heart, because I really wanted them to get it because after all the pain I'd been through, right. I really wanted them to get it. That was number one. Number two, I had to, Knowing that I'm going to be on stage in front of thousands of people every time, I had to convince myself that I need to be okay if I completely bomb, if I completely <laughs> fall flat. Because oh, yeah. there might be a time that happens and I wanted to be, in a sense, prepared that if it happens, um, I, want, I wanted to be prepared that yes, it might happen. So I would get into the feeling of what it would feel like if I was criticized, if people thought mm. I was terrible. So I allowed <clears throat> myself to get into that feeling and that actually strengthened me to stop worrying about it. I love that, that's great. So there's nothing to anticipate yeah. and then, and you know, less options. So and the, this is a off topic question, but it keeps popping up in mind. So when you're not on stage doing yeah. what you do, because you know, all of us have lives beyond our, our service, 
when you're not on stage, what's the what's the most fun thing for you to do with your time? Um, oh, lots of things, but I'm embarrassed to say that the first thing that popped into my head was shopping for shoes and purses. That's excellent. I am, yeah, but that really was the first thing that That's came awesome. into my head. <laughs> That's awesome. I hate that. All the shoes and all the purses, you know, I, uh, it's, it's it, all, it's all important. It's, I just love, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> I can't even get into it. I am so, I mean, Danny is rolling his eyes right now. <laughs> That's, funny. That's and, funny. And it's really funny because, of course, you know, I have, I, I, I love to sit quiet and meditate. I love mm -hmm. my music. I love going out to the ocean and I love, um, I love being alone. I love writing. I love doing all these things. But, um, and most people think that, people who do the work we do. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. We have a spiritual practice every day. But that's why I feel so embarrassed that the first thing that came to mind was the shopping for shoes and purses. Yes, I think I it's to be truly honest, that's what... <laughs> I think your fourth book should be all the shoes and purses. That's just the title. <laughs> All the shoes and purses. Okay, so Danny threatens to write a book about me, and he <laughs> says he's going to call it Dying to be a Diva. Wow. <laughs> A tell all. A <laughs> tell all that's, that's about my good. shoes and purses. <laughs> oh my God, that's that's hilarious. I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome. You know, when I I love my my thing is my thing is cooking. I love cooking. Yeah, that was going to be my question to you. So, what do you do when you're not on stage and writing and channeling mm. cards and things like that? Yeah, I just channeled my my first card deck today for Hay House. Uh, I sat down like for an hour and a half, and I just literally wrote the entire deck. It was amazing. Um, I'm excited well, to see them. It's what, exciting. It's, yeah. What? So tell tell us about the deck. Well, the, it's a it's a healing mantra deck. I started doing these videos on Facebook where I would just do a video and I would channel a, a mantra. And I would do the mantra and talk about what it would help heal, whether it was to help facilitate greater healing of the heart or to open the crown or happiness. And I would just come up with the mantra and repeat it a couple times to the camera and transmit the healing energy. And people really resonated with it. And then, you know, Hay House said, hey, let's make a deck. Uh, let's make a healing mantra deck. And so I sat down today because it was time for me to make it. And I thought, you know. 52 mantras what how about you do 52 mantras and i sat down and literally within an hour and a half one by one it all came out in order and i was like oh well th there it is so um you know it, it just flew out of me today like just like faucet or water coming out of a faucet but when i'm not doing that and channeling and all the stuff that i do i like to cook i like to cook it's one of my creative expressions it's another way of using my channeling ability where um I like to look at cookbooks and learn techniques and different flavor combinations. But when I shop at the store, I don't shop for uh, recipes. I shop only for ingredients. I don't have a thought process of what I'm going to do. And I go home with random ingredients and I just make food. And I, you know, I've discovered in surviving my childhood, which was primarily frozen food and oh. taco, Taco Bell. And, you know, <laughs> my, my, my first moment of invincibility surviving that. I've realized how much I really love eating healthy food and how much I love eating seasonally, how much I love vegetables. And I, I, you know, I cook really well. My wife cooks really well. And so after a few more books, I'm going to, you know, it's in the cards, it's in the cards <laughs> to, uh, to do a cookbook or two. And I want to start nice. doing cooking videos. And, you know, for me, food is a really deep passion. And when I travel to different cities, you know, the way I like to get to know a city is by walking around and, and, and eating my way through the city and just, I like to understand different cultures through food. And I think it's, um, to, to me, food is artistry. It is, um, it is a way that I express my love to my family and loved ones. And just like offering a healing to someone, you know, channeling energy or a message. And I don't know how I'm guided to say the very thing they needed to hear to heal themselves of an illness. And that's a very mysterious, magical thing that I, I have been blessed with the ability to do. And when I can cook a meal for someone and it pleases their heart, that's also a very intangible moment of ecstasy that I can't quite put into words. 
beautiful yeah. that's beautiful and you know i love cooking too mm. i just love cooking and i never use recipes either i can't i can't stick to them yeah so <laughs> one day when we're in the same city we got to cook each other a meal let's do that yeah and i'm waiting for you to do those cooking shows i will be watching them i love, I, I love cooking food because i love to I love to play with ingredients, but I also love to know everything that goes into the food. Mm. And to me, it's important that food is cooked with love because when you go to, I don't like um, fast food restaurants because you don't know what goes in the food and also right. the energies of the people who's made the food for you. So oh, of um, course. yeah, Danny and I, we love to cook both of us. And so I would love to taste your, your cooking. Oh, I'd love to taste yours. So what, what is your, uh, you know, if, if, if someone were to come to your home and you were to cook them a meal and you, you were to cook them like your specialty, what would that be? It would be coconut vegetable curry. Whoa. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I will get whatever the fresh seasonal vegetables mm -hmm. are and I would mix up a curry paste and uh, onions and, and fry up. Well, not really fry, like a, a stir fry mm -hmm. the vegetables in the curry paste and then pour in the coconut cream. Coconut I'm so, cream. I'm so hungry right now. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Wow. And then we have it on a bed of quinoa or brown rice or rice, whatever they prefer. Um, okay. And it's it's my favorite thing to to make, to serve, to eat. I love eating it. Well, that sounds awesome. Yeah. And if I could download uh, a bowl of that <laughs> with the purchase of your next book. You're on. <laughs> I'm on. I'm going to wait on my computer. I'm going to download the Kindle and be like, okay, where is this coconut <laughs> curry coming from? That would be amazing. Oh, that would be so cool. Oh, that should be in my next book. <laughs> See? See? Yeah. Or, or I should say, ooh, and you download Matt's third book. Oh, you get an Ina Morjani's coconut curry. I'm going to leverage it. That'd be awesome. <laughs> that would be cool. You get a free gift of my coconut curry. So that what's your say. specialty? Oh, my goodness. Um, it's a good question. You know, I, I cook a lot of, I feel like I have past lives in the Mediterranean because I cook a lot of Mediterranean food and I don't have any knowledge of Mediterranean. I just know the flavors and I know. I have this dish that I made. It's actually the first dish I ever channeled. And it was the first dish I made for my wife. And um, it was one of the times where, you know, you cook for your beloved. I'm sure you've cooked for Danny. But when I cooked for my wife, and this is when we were dating, it was kind of like, I'm like, oh, let me make you something. I'm just going to whip up something. I kind of downplayed it a little bit. And I just took um, orange segments and I tossed it or I topped it with crushed pistachios, toasted crushed pistachios. Um, and then I did chopped up mint leaves. Okay. And then I topped it with coarse sea salt, a drizzle of olive oil and a drizzle of honey. That's it. Oh, that sounds good. And it was delicious. It's refreshing. It's sexy. And my wife took a bite of this and, and looked at me and said, honey, like, as in, what did you just do? And I'm like, that's how I cook. And, you know, for me, I had a really big breakthrough about cooking uh, a couple years ago. I went to a spa and I ate spa cuisine, which was really healthy, but very refreshing and light. And I had the big realization that, my God, I, I can please my palate with healthy food and it satisfies me more than something that's really overtly decadent. And I'd never had that experience until I was an adult. And so I kind of saw that lighter food, healthier food, can actually satisfy me more than something heavy and decadent. And so at that time, I started opening up my mind to this idea of Mediterranean spa cuisine. And I don't know how I started doing this, but I started thinking like that and just how balanced of a dish can I create? How light can it be? And how refreshing? And um, when I cured myself of asthma, I eliminated all sulfates out of my diet. Oh. So I usually don't use vinegar. I use all citrus fruit. And that, that is one of the little things I do to make it extra clean and extra refreshing. And it just, I don't know, I've got this thing about the way I cook and my friends come over and everyone loves it. So it's just going to be like, as I continue to write books and teach and offer group healing events, I'm going to roll out cookbooks. Wow, I love it. I love it. And Danny and I are salivating right now listening to your recipe. He loves, he loves you because he's a cook as well. We both uh, love cooking. And that's how he, I fell in love with him because for me, um, and you know, 23 years ago, 
uh, as an Indian woman, a man who cooked for me mm. was like, oh my God, this, this, this guy's a keeper. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So, so how, how long have you been together? We've been married for almost 24 years. And when did you meet? Um, a, about three years before that. So yeah. we met um, probably in 1990. So that's a long time, 1990. So we met 28 years ago. My goodness, 1990. Yeah. Yes, 1990. And we've been married for 24 years, engaged for one year before that. And so we met three years before that. That's amazing. When you met 1990, I think I was just entering high school. Was it something like that? Yes. Wow, that's amazing. I had come out of a broken um, engagement, an arranged marriage engagement. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yes. And I had run away. And um, my... Um, it, and in my culture, that was a huge thing to do back then, mm -hmm. like a really, really big deal. And um, I was ostracized from my culture. I was told that no Indian man would marry me. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that was it. <laughs> my future is over in this culture. And I really felt awful because I'd brought shame to my family. Mm -hmm. I brought shame to my fiance's family. And then there was Danny who was like, hey, I love you and well done for doing what you did. <laughs> he was actually, you know, cheering me on. Yeah. It was like, so he was, he was so different. He was just amazing. And, um, and he had a sense of humor and he, and when he told his parents he wanted to marry me, they said, but that's the girl that ran away from the marriage. And, <laughs> and he goes, yeah, that's why I love her. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So he's, He's been, yeah, I, I've really been blessed in my, in my relationship. Well, and, and when you said, you know, what you're saying about the arranged marriages, uh, it struck me as being interesting because I'm sure in, in, a, in a cultural setting, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not okay to break those cultural norms, if you will. Um, and I'm sure there's, there's so many people um, in, in the world that are still kind of finding themselves in those situations. So, what, what I wonder is in that situation, when you're in an arranged marriage and you know that this is not going to be the life that you want for yourself, what was it that kind of caused you to be able to say, despite all the pressure and all the, you know, all, all, all the pressure coming to me from my family, what was it that allowed you to finally be able to make that stand for yourself? See, it was really hard to make that stand because I was at this place where I knew that I was in a lose-lose situation. I knew that if I married him, it's like being fed to the alligators. And I knew that if I ran away, I was also causing a huge problem because I was afraid of the repercussions. Mm. And I knew there were going to be huge repercussions. I wasn't sure if I was more afraid, um, which I wasn't sure which I was more afraid of. But here's the thing, which is a very typical of a people pleaser, is that I didn't feel it was right from the beginning, even the time when mm. I agreed to the engagement, but I was too much of a people pleaser to say no. Mm. Um, so, in, so I was engaged for eight months, but at the, at the point where I was actually told or said that, um, that, the, you know, that we're putting you together with this family, you get to go out once or twice, and then you have to make up your mind. Mm -hmm. After going out that once, I wasn't ready to say yes. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I need to go out more and get to know, I, I need to get to know him more. What I was told was that he had said yes, mm -hmm. and if I now say no, um, I would be seen as being too choosy. Mm. And, mm, and so it, it wouldn't look good. It would be insulting to them if I now said no. So I wasn't ready to say yes, but I said yes because I didn't want to disappoint everyone. Mm. So this is the thing. But in my heart, in my gut, it didn't feel right from the moment I didn't say yes. Right. So as time wears on, you go mm -hmm. through like month after month, I already know it's wrong, but I'm too scared to pull out. Right. And this is so typical. It's like, if I had said no in the beginning, I wouldn't have caused as much trouble. At the point I pulled out, it was three days before the wedding. 
Mm. And the wedding was supposed to be in India. I mean, we had all flown to India. Mm. All the guests had flown there. Everything was booked. And, you know, if you know anything about Indian weddings, the venues, the horses, the elephants, the people have flown in with all the gifts. And three days before the wedding, I ran away. So, um, wow. so you end up causing more trouble and causing a bigger problem because you're afraid to say no. And so, uh, but at that moment, it was more like, okay, I, I'll tell you what, why I was able, what it was. The one thing mm. was I knew what my future was with him, Go, uh, you know, like in that moment, it was like, okay, I know what's in store for me. If I go mm -hmm. through with it, yeah. I'm going to roll the dice. So it's that. The, even though the other future is also really bad and that I'm going to be ostracized and everything, but there is an element of unknown in there. Mm. So I'm going to roll the dice and chance it and take what's unknown because mm. even the unknown is better than what I know my future is going to be over here. I like that. Yeah. The no option was better than the displayed option. Yes, the no option was better than the displayed option. And I knew that I would be, because I was told that I was go not going to be allowed to work. I had to be um, a homemaker, a housewife. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to cook his favorite foods and cook mm -hmm. and clean and take care of his parents. I mean, it was all laid out for me. My future right. was laid out for me. And the other one was a big unknown. Wow. So I thought, I'm going to take a risk and roll the dice on the unknown. Well, I love that. And, you know, it, I've taken risks in my life that have, have always, you know, opened up great miracles. Uh, just, of, of course, as you have, we're, we're talking about them. There's a lot of probably in our audience crossover, whether we're empaths or people pleasers and energetically sensitive beings. So from, you, from your standpoint, what would you say would be the best advice to any empath, sensitive, or people, people pleaser who's living in a life that feels like some sort of arranged marriage and they want to roll the dice and step out of the framework of their known reality, what advice would you personally give them to be able to make that step for themselves? Wow. I would actually tell them to just do it. And, and the way mm. to, to do it, like what I did, is I want them to actually envision two scenarios. Mm. One is the scenario of staying where you are now. Now think of yourself staying where you are now. Think of yourself one year from now, mm. five years from now. How do you feel? How do you feel thinking of yourself five years from now in this same situation? And I think at some level, that's what came to me. Like I could see it year after year and me getting older in that situation. And I had dreams. Now in, I want you to think of another scenario where you, even if you make a lot of people, um, you know, angry for a while, but mm -hmm. you, you've just got this clear open canvas to live out your dreams. Mm -hmm. I'm aware, even as I say this, that with people who have small kids and things like mm -hmm. that, it's probably more challenging. But here's the thing. If you can actually accommodate the children, take the children with you, don't compromise on love for children. Mm -hmm. Children will be happier if you're happier than That's right. if you're miserable. Absolutely. And, and I, I think also what I've seen also in helping so many families, whether parents are reconciling or learning how to parent or co-parent together. What I have found in my work with families and, and parents in particular is that children can adjust to any kind of change as long as there is unconditional love guiding through the process. And I think that when, you know, what children are learning as they evolve is that, you know, life does change. There are going to be unforeseen circumstances. There are going to be surprises. There are going to be things that we didn't expect. And what we learn is that it's not the changes that cause us to feel the way we feel, but the quality of our emotional journey throughout each change is based on how aligned or misaligned we are. And as parents, we have an opportunity to love our children so that they can get to know the feelings of well-being and alignment so that when change comes knocking on our door, whether seen, desired, or unforeseen, 
we realize it's not the change that's going to affect me, but how aligned I am with every step forward. Yes, that's very beautifully said. And you said something really important there, that the children uh, thrive with unconditional love. I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. but through changes, they adjust well with change as long as they've got unconditional love. And really, that's the um, the main thing the parent has to be conscious of. No matter what you're going through, you don't have to suffer and compromise your entire life for your children. Because right. if you think back yourself, if you realized that your parents compromised and suppressed themselves and suffered because of you, you don't feel good about that. You mm. would rather your parents did what, what they needed to do to be happy as long as they continued to love you. So really that's, that's the key for parents is you, they need to honor themselves, but they need to be conscious that this is an upheaval for my children. So I need to be more, more conscious about making a bigger effort to mm. love them unconditionally and show them that I love them unconditionally. Absolutely, you know, children, we can define children or describe children as resilient and adults tend to be guilty. And so the reason why, and so adults project their insecurities onto their children, like my child's not gonna survive this, but really what it is is the projected insecurities of an adult because an adult is closer to the propensity of guilt, whereas a child is more hardwired for resilience. As long as a parent can explain to a child, here's what's happening and here's how we deal with change. And sometimes in life things happen that we can't expect. And as long as a child has a companion, has a support system, has the ability to express their feelings. Maybe parents work with their children to, you know, do art projects and honey, you know, let's, let's paint out our feelings. Let's color our feelings. What color is your anger? And things like this, we really are here to teach children the coping mechanisms and the conscious skills that helps us to utilize change as an evolutionary transformative mechanism to where we say, I didn't ask for this but it will make me better if I know how to surrender. So I think that instead of parents feeling guilty of doing the things that their soul calls to do, it's really that the parents and child both sign up for an evolutionary adventure where the parent's job is to be such a lover and a supporter of the child that the child learns to use unforeseen change as an opportunity to grow instead of a reason to shut down. Wow. That will be so helpful for so many people listening. That's I know. so great. Yeah. And I'm just going to turn to Danny and see, do we have any questions that we would love to? Let's punch some up. Ooh. Karen White. Ooh. How can you do this with your adult child with mental health addiction issues? Hmm. So, you know, what comes to me initially about that, when we talk about an adult child with addiction issues, you know, the first thing we want to look at, we, and, and they said mental issues mental. And, and addiction tendencies, um, in both mental imbalances and addiction issues, we have the same goal. And the goal is to stabilize. When there's a mental imbalance, we want to stabilize brain chemistry. When it comes to addiction, we want to stabilize one's consciousness through sobriety. And so I think the first goal before we can really begin reaching out to a soul that might be dealing with some of these issues is we have to really look as to how we can best stabilize their environment. Now, I know it probably is an added, um, you know, an added facet that this is an adult child, not an underage child. So really what the best job a parent can do is to suggest and inspire their child to stabilize and to look for the normalcy of balance and harmony because often in the awakening journey you know awakening is a very sobering journey where we're not sobering up from drugs or alcohol we're sobering up from the brain chemistry of ego consciousness mm -hmm. so awakening is a very sobering journey and before any kind of journey of sobriety we first need to stabilize the environment when I tune into the, to the questioner, I think what's most important is to be that unconditional loving support to her adult child, to give suggestions that would promote stability, but to not wear the burden of her child's journey on her heart as to codependently say, 
I'm going to be burdened by my child's imbalances until they decide to get better. And then when they get better, I can be let off the hook. So I think it's a balance between being a loving, steadfast supporter of our adult children and all the circumstances that they're plagued with. And at the same time, learning to have our heart open and not wear the burden of someone else's journey. Because if we wear their burden and we take it on in a codependent way, we're keeping our heart closed. And then when we engage with that adult child, it's our mind engaging with their mind, which is going to be um, a wrestling match. And if we can take the burden and surrender it for the, the potential of their journey, no matter how it's going to unfold, we can say, my job is to promote well-being is to introduce stability, and I love my child unconditionally, I give them permission to have their journey, to make their choices, to not make their choices a reflection of how, you know, what kind of parent I was, and, and to break the, you know, to break the cycle of codependency, to be as unconditionally loving towards our children. And then of course, in private, we must unconditionally love ourselves through the heartbreak of what could be the destiny of a soul's journey. Beautiful, really. Really, really great answer. And that was a great question. I love that question. That's, yeah. I mean, I mean, what do you do in that situation? And so, I mean, I mean, have you ever had a, in your life, have you ever had a situation where you saw what was the best thing for another person, but you can't force them to make that choice for themselves? Like, what did you do? Have you ever had a situation where, where, you, where you saw what someone needed, but they weren't ready to hear it? Yes. It? Yes. Quite a few times. And what did you do? And it's really hard because they they need to see it for themselves. Right. And you can see that what they're doing isn't working for them, but they have reasons why they're not changing their life. And right. they think those are valid reasons, but you can see the journey that they could be taking, but they're not ready to see it yet. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and what I found in my personal life and even professionally is that there's a very weird uh, mechanism in, in, in ego consciousness. Uh, and the mechanism is that if someone has something to suggest to an ego that is going to promote well-being and positivity in their life, the subconscious mind of an ego only perceives it as in order for the other person to be right, I must be wrong by comparison or by default. So the person actually shuts down from opening up to a greater point of view, because like in that example, mom's not trying to help me get sober, mom's right, therefore I must be wrong. So they shut down in a state of disempowerment. And I think what happens is, you know, we can suggest and promote well-being and sobriety and stabilization and all the things we're talking about. But we have to let people have their own journey. We have to let it dawn upon them. And only when they think that it's a decision they came up with on their own, will they really own the kind of choices that will lead to long-term health, wholeness, and um, harmony. Yeah, exactly. And see, the thing is that um, in this case, the child is an adult child. Right. And so with an adult child, you the only thing you can do is love them regardless, regardless right. of whether the child changes or not. Right. And you need to love them through it and, and yet not let go of your own dreams right. and try and work your dreams into your life while you're still loving your child unconditionally. I guess Absolutely. that's the way I see it. But it doesn't mean you have to let go of your dreams um, because and, and this is not the case in, in, in this person's case, but an example that I'm thinking of, a completely different case, mm -hmm. where um, when I was looking at it from the outside, uh, it was a completely different situation. So I want to make sure that the lady who posted that question knows that I'm not talking uh, about her. But there was a, a lady who was having trouble with a adult child who was... Um, um, who, who was having issues that were more, um, he was getting in trouble with the law. Mm -hmm. He was getting in trouble and she was afraid that if she pursued her dreams, he would get in trouble with the law and he would, mm -hmm. uh, you know, end up in prison if she wasn't there looking after him. But this was an adult. And I felt that, um, and when I looked at the situation, it looked like he, knew that he was able to manipulate his mother mm. and that 
by allowing herself to man be ma manipulated, she was enabling him. Mm. She needed to love him unconditionally, but she needed to get on with her life. And I think he would have grown up and learned more had she done that. So That's really interesting. I had a similar situation of, of counseling a family where they had an adult child living in their house and the adult child was addicted to drugs and alcohol, but they felt like as long as they're living under our house, we can monitor it and they're going to be safe. And I said, well, what do you think it's going to take for your child to be, to finally be sober? And they said, well, I, I don't know. I can't imagine that. And I said, well, what if, and I said, well, how is it having this energy in this person who's abusing drugs and alcohol and that you are, you know, enabling in the name of unconditional love? Uh, how is that affecting your household? And they said, oh, it's, it's tearing our family apart. And I said, and what, what, what would happen if I said to you that it would only be the rock bottom moment of this person facing potential homelessness that would wake them up into surrender and to sobriety? And then mom said, I can't even imagine that. And I said, and the fact that you can't imagine that and you're trying to protect your child from that is actually robbing them of the opportunity of breaking through. Wow. And it was not a very popular conversation. And I say that with a compassionate heart for all beings, but how do we actually know what someone needs in order to click in the wisdom that many of us know so effortlessly? How do we know what someone needs if we're spending time trying to protect them from the things that we can't watch them go through? So it's not even like I can accept that maybe this being needs this big moment of realization. Here's what's going to cause it. I can't go through the feelings in my body of watching my child have to go through what they need to go through in order to break through to the next level of consciousness. So that's where the really the healing of codependency allows us to love unconditionally, but at the same time, we have to learn how to love without enabling. And that is one of the hardest things to learn in this planet, I, I truly believe. It really is one of the hardest things. So in other words, we are preventing that person mm -hmm. who we love from having the experience that will take them to the next level of growth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we would we would rather sacrifice ourselves and say, I know how to hurt and I would rather hurt because what's more painful than me being in pain, because it's familiar to me, is watching someone else go through pain and trying to tread water when they don't know how to swim. And I can't even deal with watching that. So I'd rather sacrifice myself not knowing that I'm not sparing them of more pain. I'm actually blocking them from the entry point of their own awakening journey. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot like um, helping the butterfly come out of the cocoon. You know that story. I do. Like when you see the butterfly struggling to come out of the cocoon and imagine you think, oh, I'm going to make their path easier. And so you kind of open up the cocoon. But the thing is, and so when the butterfly comes out because you opened it up for them, they come out, they can't fly because the 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 wings haven't developed because the wings actually need to break the cocoon open mm -hmm. for the fluids to flow into the wings so that they can fly. Then the wings haven't had that happen to them if you release them and so they can't fly. And then you have basically um, damaged or um, handicapped the butterfly for the rest of their lives. And I guess as humans, we, we do that with each other. We think we're protecting people, but at the same time, we're preventing them from having experiences, from experiencing what they need to. Absolutely. And, you know, I can, as a testament, you know, I'm, I'm a very energetically sensitive being. And I grew up in a family with two parents who did the best job they could. They were wonderful parents. You know, both my parents had eat their own ego stuff, of course. And there's a lot of, you know, family dynamic and weird, you know, a psychological and emotional, like, you know, turmoil that it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized, you know, some of the things that didn't make sense to me. But what's interesting is I grew up in a, a household and I was an asthmatic as a kid. I was a very uh, deeply asthmatic child. And so I lived a very sheltered life. My parents were very afraid of anything happened to me. So I was sheltered a lot of my life. I didn't play sports. Um, and I was a very sheltered child. And what, what's interesting is that as a sheltered child, I was more afraid of the world and any time in my life. And when I became an adult and I had to live my life governed by my own pr rules and principles, and I, in effect, had to live 
as my own mother and father, um, as my parents got older and crossed over, uh, what I found is the unsheltering of myself freed me of fear, and it was the sheltering of myself that put me in fear. Huh. See, that's a paradox. And yeah. it's interesting because your parents were trying to protect you from the world. But in trying to protect you, they were sending you the message that we live in an unsafe world that's right. from which you need protection. Right. That and is what they actually communicated to you by being protective over you. That's right. My nervous system would subconsciously wonder, what are they protecting me from? It must be scary. It must be big. It must be all the things I don't want to experience. And so it allowed my imagination to constantly become the ever-changing monster that my parents were trying to protect me from. And then when I came out of hiding and I came out being a sheltered child, I realized that the only thing that my parents were protecting me from was me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that, that was a huge realization like wow I spent my entire life afraid of the things I thought were out there and I realized that they've only been living inside my mind and I have spent 40 years battling with the scariest thing I've ever encountered which is me and now that I'm totally at peace and in love with me what could I be afraid of <laughs> nothing <laughs> nothing <laughs> That's that's a really cool realization. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. Yeah, I think it is. Oh, so here's a fun question. And then okay. the fear. What did you, or, whether current or when you were younger, what were you the most afraid of? Um, displeasing people. Mm. And disappointing people, displeasing people. That mm. was my biggest fear, you know, feeling shame and feeling other people's disappointment. Mm, that's a good one. I was afraid of hurting people. Ah. If people said I hurt them, and most of the time it was just people trying to get their way, if I thought I hurt, like I would want to turn myself into the police. Like I was, I felt so awful. Like, please arrest me. I've hurt someone. So I was the most afraid. Well, I was, okay. So I was afraid of three things. Here, I'm out of camera. Boop. Three things. I was afraid of hurting people. Yep. I was afraid of jaws, and I was afraid of bees. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of hurting people as well. I hated the feeling yeah. of hurting people. I would avoid hurting people. I was one of those mm. people that would, I couldn't stand the sight of blood and go, mm. I still can't. I, um, I, I hate blood and violence. So I was afraid of um, violent TV movies, always mm. afraid of that. Afraid of um, displeasing people. Mm. Um, and I guess if there was a third thing, and hey, and I'd love people to post, what are you guys afraid of? I, oh, let them post, let's see it in the comments. What's everyone afraid of? Name three things. <laughs> if I had to name a third thing, um, cockroaches. Hate, ah. hate, hate cockroaches more than any other creature in the world. Poor cockroaches. I know they probably have a consciousness. I don't kill them, but I just don't like them. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, you know, it keeps us, keeps us human it keeps us humble and i think that you know as you are aware of you know you experience going to heaven and just like i experienced that and many awakenings we both had i, I think the the great thing about awakening when it really awakens on a heart-centered level is that awakening enlightenment however you want to put it it really prepares us to come back to the body to really live the human journey at full capacity it's not about transcending the body it's not get, about getting away from the ego it's about you have an otherworldly experience that gives you the skills, capacity, and capabilities to come back in the body and say, now that you've seen what's out there beyond this world, now take this energy and master the world. And I think that's, that's the beauty of what we're talking about here is that you and I are talking about being people who have, like a lot of people who are watching this video, are, are touching into a higher consciousness, are allowing a higher consciousness to manifest within our bodies. And we're, and we're doing that within the beauty and the artistry of individual expression. We're not trying to look at a personality like a disease. We're just yeah. trying to help allow the personality to be the clearest expression of our own divinity. Yes, exactly. Um, and again, well said. And I always say death taught me how to live. And probably, that. yeah. And, and, and the thing is, I didn't come back to 
renounce the world and to <laughs> live as a hermit. I didn't do that because if that was my dharma, if that was my purpose, I probably would have stayed on the other side. There would have been no reason to come back. I right. actually came back to integrate that experience here in this world. It taught me how to live. It also taught me that heaven is not just a place. Right. It's also a state of being. Mm. And, and what I realized is that we live, we, we have for some reason chosen to live in a state of fear. Mm. Heaven is the absence of that fear. Mm -hmm. And, and right. when we can transcend that fear, um, that's, that's what it feels like to live in the state of heaven. I love that. And you know what else we learned from that? We learned that no one with a high self-esteem renounces the world. Yeah. Right? Oh. It, 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 when you have a high self-esteem, when you have a purpose, when you are living a life of alignment or congruence, no matter what your external is, when you feel good about you, there is no sense in you that says, I have to renounce this world and this world is less than, and I use the entire planet as a stepping stone to a greater spiritual attainment. Oftentimes, you know, spiritual journeys have been the antidote to the cycles of human suffering. So traditionally, people are trying to find a spiritual answer that takes them out of the pain instead of let's have a roadmap that takes us not just into the pain, but into what the greatest purpose is for the pain. So not to transcend the world, but to allow the world to be our location of mastery. Hmm, wow, that's profound. Yeah, wow. Have we got more questions or comments or what are people afraid of? What's everyone else's fears? I'm afraid of cats. Ah, <laughs> I get cats. Oh, sweater, Chola. I love cats. Being homeless, porn alone, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's... And, and this person's avatar is a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I was afraid of God. Oh, that's a very good one. That's Ros, a very good one. That's a good one. I was too until I yeah. died and went to heaven and realized, hey, <laughs> there's nothing to be afraid of. Being Ooh, rejected. Being yeah, rejected. That's a big one, that's that's a a big big one. one too, yes. Be yeah. Afraid of God is also, it's a huge one. Oh, I hate being afraid, period. period. Yeah. Wow. I'm guessing you're afraid of a lot of things. That's yeah, funny. bullying every day. I'm so sorry, Roxanne. We love you. Yeah. Oh, mm. big hugs to you, Roxanne. Afraid of heights, deep water going too fast, and I do it all. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> That's an awesome one. Yeah. Hurting, Hurting anyone, you stupid your, thoughts. Oh. Your thoughts sound stupid and 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 i've seen your posts and they're all so lovely and loving ronnie <laughs> she's we love loving we love you and norma i'm afraid of hurting others disappointing others and sharks see sharks see that's the same as us <laughs> i'm afraid of those three things that's too. scary everything karen says oh karen oh honey no. oh Love hearing you two discuss the importance. But yay! I yay. love you too. Love you too. Love you. And, and we love each other too. Yeah, we do. And in fact, um, there's one topic I wanted to cover and speak mm -hmm. to you about. Is a lot of people have a misconception about unconditional love. And mm -hmm. particularly, um, I think women more than men believe mm -hmm. that in order to love men unconditionally or love people unconditionally, including their children, uh, means allowing them to treat them any way they please. Mm. In other words, they open themselves up for abuse and then say, but um, I don't know how to stop the abuse. Right. At the same time, they feel that when they stop the abuse, they're not loving that person unconditionally. Do you, do you right. know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, they it's like, juggle, yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah, they juggle with loving people unconditionally without being exploited and abused. Yeah, it's almost like someone staying in an abusive relationship in the name of, of, of trying to accept what is. Yes, and in the name of unconditional love. Right. Yes. You know, I, I've seen that, you know, this is a really dark, dark spot of codependency and where we start to become not only the enablers of other people's shadow, but we actually, um, we think that 
by being someone's doormat, we're going to give them the acceptance they never had. And if we can just be their doormat long enough, they're going to get the acceptance and the validation they never received before. And that's going to wake them up out of their spell. And then we're finally going to have the partner that we've always wanted. And I think that the key in all of this behavior is people putting up with unnecessary neglect or abuse. And, and what's interesting is their idea or their idealization of their mate that says, if I can just get them to shift this way or that way, I'll finally have the mate that I desire. So I think the real key is, are you in relationship with your partner as they are now? And if they never changed again, would you be totally happy with how they treat you? Or are you holding your breath and waiting them for them to finally become their potential and allowing you to be their emotional or physical or energetic punching bag, just waiting for the moment that their potential finally rises to the surface. And so I think what breaks the cycle of this codependency and this enabling and this abuse is when we're not in relationship, we're unconditionally loving, of course, but we're in relationship with who people are right here, right now, whether they never change another day in their life and not in relationship with who people could maybe become. Hmm. Uh, you said it better than I could have. That's... Oh, your words are great. <laughs> I love your words too. See, that's, the, that's why I love doing these conversations because it's so great to, you know, we, we, when I have conversations like this with like-minded people, it's like a love fest. You're speaking mm. my language, but you're speaking it in different words and, yeah. and I'm speaking your language and, and it just feels like you get each other and... Yes, it's, it's, uh, yeah, no words. <laughs> I love that. You know, and it's, it's a very hard thing because we all have this idea of the kind of partner we want. And we all walk around kind of as these like casting directors of our mo life's movie. And we're like trying to cast the right person to play the role of lover or spouse or uh, co parent or whatever we're trying to cast. And so then we're meeting people and we're checking things off the list, going, oh, they kind of have these qualities. And it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like someone who's like at the gold rush looking for gold and they don't find gold and uh, they finally find like a little speck of glitter and they go, ah, screw it. Close enough. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's one of these things where we have this idea of what we look, we're looking for and we have to envision the qualities we want to know that we're worthy of having it all. But what I think is really interesting is instead of just getting together with someone and go, oh, well, they could potentially become the one that I envision. So let's work towards that. What I think is interesting is dating is where you get to know how close someone is from your idea of a partner and who they are in reality. And once you see who they are in reality, if that's the person that you're willing to be with, sun up and sun down, and that they never grew another day in their life, you'd be totally happy, then engage in a relationship. Yes. But if after the dating process, you realize my potential mate and their current reality are not really matching, to get in a relationship with someone hoping that over time, those things are going to match up is usually the recipe for when someone sensitive gets in a relationship with someone that either neglects, abuses, or disregards their boundaries. And it's the person that's settled or thought that their person would grow into their potential that often takes the abuse or the brunt of that other person's unconsciousness, which of course is not unconditionally loving to ourselves. So I think there has to be this really interesting agreement that before we are able to unconditionally love others, we have to make sure that we are in environments that are unconditionally loving for ourselves. Yes, it's really important to unconditionally love yourself first. Yes. And, and when you are in a relationship or getting into a relationship, what's really important is how does your partner treat you? Because a lot of people make this mistake and I know that um, I still know a lot of people, uh, young people who still kind of think in terms of partners, actually not just young people, even mm -hmm. single people I know of my own age, um, who think in terms of, um, they make a list of what they want to see in a partner. Mm -hmm. So the partner has to kind of like look good on paper. Right. What I always say is what's really important is how your partner treats you. 
Yes. That is so important. How does your partner make you feel? Of course. Do they make you feel like you're number one in their life, that you're really yeah. important? Because it doesn't matter if they tick all the boxes, but if they're not making you feel good, then I would run a mile from them. I really would. Absolutely. And you know what I would also add to this, just as to create the, the full circle of, of, of course, you know, I love what you're saying about how does a partner treat you. One thing I think also is, is, is somewhat of an unspoken rule, and this is, I think, things people miss all the time, is pay attention to how someone treats other people. And it doesn't matter if it's a waiter at a restaurant yes. or it's their own relative who they think is annoying. If the person you are with has the propensity to disrespect any other person, it's only going to be a matter of time and circumstance before they treat you that way. That's right. That's right. It's a good one. How do they treat? Yeah, everybody from the person at the checkout to the right. waiter at the restaurant. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Absolutely. What, a, what an amazing dialogue we had. I know. I'm, let's, let's go to one last question and then we totally. can close it off. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. One last question. I think Danny's got something. No? Okay. I'll bet there were lots of questions there, but they kind of go whizzing by really they fast. Do. They do, don't they? Yeah, this whole Facebook Live thing is so... I'm, I'm still getting used to it because I, I, I do it for Hay House and it's the things whiz by and it's, it's, it's like being in the Minority Report movie. It's just so many things happening. I know, it's a lot of things going on at once. Yeah. I know sometimes I feel so old when I... <laughs> I feel old too. Yeah. yeah, when it comes to social media. Thank God I have a social media manager, Milena, who takes care of my social media but yeah it's way beyond me yeah totally i should get one of those that, that sounds like a lot of fun i need to see so, so here's the thing you need to go shopping for shoes and purses and i need to get myself a social media manager there yeah. you go there you go then we'll okay. be all set and then we'll get together and we'll have coconut curry we'll have coconut curry and i will wear the new shoes and purse i and i will bring my uh, social media manager <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's it. <laughs> You're awesome, Anita. I love you. I love you too, Matt. You're so awesome. Thank you. And your wife is really beautiful. Just love thank her. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And we loved having brunch with you both. And it was just such a you know group of kindred spirits. And she, she and I, she and I still to this day talk about that meeting and how much fun we had. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I wish you guys lived closer so we could have coconut curry together. Well. We're going to plan a trip then. We're going to, I think I'm coming to LA uh, for something. I've, I forgot what, but we will let you know and we will be having coconut curry and um, we, we should Facebook live eating the coconut curry. We will do that. And, and I want to thank everybody else for tuning in and for their patience while we were going through our technical issues. I think, yeah, I think the, um, the technology couldn't handle our energies. <laughs> hey, I love it. You know, like I said, sensitive people have been plagued by energies for so many years. It's about time we start, you know, fighting Taking back. revenge. That's right. In the name of love. In the name of love. The revenge of the sensitive people. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That'll be our new movie. <laughs> which, which is not a big revenge of sensitive people because most of us are taking naps. <laughs> Oh, but it, it will be a revenge of some sort. <laughs> Maybe a nasty letter or a, or a, you know, we'll figure it out. Yeah, it's time for sensitive people to rise up. I love it. Well, again, thanks for having me. It's been amazing. And, um, you know, I love, I love connecting with you. And I love the fact that you and I can have this time to really connect with both of our audiences and just re reach all sensitive people and, and all heart-centered beings and, and just in, in a way really give the message um, a full integration of the soul that you know there are experiences that blast us out and there are times that bring us back in and it's really about living the most balanced and inspired and passionate life yes. that allows us to truly find that purpose and to embody it and, and, to, and to find the true fulfillment that is here for all of us yes absolutely and to have fun while they're on this ride yes enjoy it enjoy it don't take life too seriously and uh, you know we're all spiritual anyway whether we realize it or not totally <laughs> yeah so thank you so much for agreeing to do this matt this was so much uh, fun great way to pleasure. spend an evening i appreciate it so good to see you so good to see you too thanks <laughs> and 
thanks to the audience, to everyone who tuned in, everybody who decided to watch. Thank you for tuning in. Hope we, you know, hope we did something for you. <laughs>